Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I hope everyone's doing well out there. Today we're going to discuss finite impulse response filters. We're partway through the big digital filtering mess and this is the next obvious topic in that category. And it's probably the most important part of the filtering section of the course. So let's jump right into it and see how we do here. Uh, so to start with filtering, probably the details of filtering, let's back up a step and discuss something called convolution. And you can sort of think of uh, convolution as where you take a sequence of samples and you convolve it with a sequence of coefficients. And that's sort of the process of taking it, multiplying it by everything and adding them all up to get a new thing. So the, for our DFT that we talked about previously, we had this nice equation for the DFT, right? Where um, you take the, the, to get the kth frequency bin, we take the, a bunch of the samples and multiply each one by a coefficient. And if we think of this coefficient e to the minus i blah as sort of an arbitrary constant, a, that albeit a complex constant, then we can think of this thing as just a sum of terms, each of which is some coefficient times the nth sample for some n. And that is a standard convolution operation. This is sort of the standard way we do filtering. We take, for FIR filters, we take past input samples, we multiply them by nice fixed linear coefficients, and then we add them up and we get the current sample value and we're good to go. Um, we characterize filters in terms of impulse response. So I keep saying finite impulse response filter. What does that even mean? Well, an impulse is just a sample that has maximum amplitude for exactly one sample, a signal that has maximum amplitude for exactly one sample. And after that, as it moves it, uh, it, uh, you know, the, to the left, the, uh, that, that it's all zeros. And so we have a single sample that's maximal and then a bunch of zero samples, that's an impulse sample. And the question is, if I stick something like that into a system that's gonna process it, what comes out? Obviously, if the system is a perfect, you know, unity gain, zero delay system, when I stick the impulse in, it instantly comes out, and then as I stick zeros in, they instantly come out. Most systems have latency, have delay, have lag. And so if I stick the impulse in, well, the impulse will still come out perfectly, but it'll come out a little later than it went in, and then the zeros will start coming out just like before. Um, if you look at our DFT, right, because of the way that the convolution works up here, the DFT will um, take your impulse and for any given frequency bin, as it enters it, that little Gaussian filter will start and you'll start to see the, the level of the samples in the filter bin go up and then they'll go down again. So we have sort of a finite impulse response. We say that after a while, the impulse will be gone and all that will be left is the zeros. And so that's what finite impulse response means, is any impulse presented to the filter will eventually go away. There's also such a thing as infinite impulse response filters. Uh, and the trick with impulse in response filters is we not only can convolve the, you know, convolve samples with coefficients for past samples, we also convolve with coefficients for future outputs you know, for outputs that we are, for past outputs. That is, we sort of convolve into the future. So the IR filter uses the output that was previously put out or that will be put out, whichever way you want to think of it, to, as another input to decide how to filter. Um, so the, the output of the filter is going to be sort of looped back into the inputs. And that's the interesting thing, the inter you know, why? Well, because it turns out that this makes a really cheap filter. You can use much smaller convolutions to produce a filter of comparable quality. Um, we'll talk next lecture about the details of that. 
But one of the weird consequences of that is that an impulse put into a system like this never really goes away. That impulse will be appear on the output where it will be looped back into the input and then appear on the output again where it will be looped back into the input. And so it's going to keep cycling around. And of course, over time, hopefully, each time it goes through the cycle, the impulse will be a little smaller. We want the, th the impulse to decay or else the filter is what's called unstable and it will make a horrible mess. But still, you know, in principle, if signals weren't quantized in amplitude as well as time, you know, if we look out far enough into the future, we would still see some tiny trace of that original impulse that went in, infinite impulse response. Uh, so why don't we do everything with, uh, that should say IIR filters. I don't know why it says FIR. IIR filters have a cheap implementation per unit quantity, quality, but they're less flexible, they're harder to design, and they have lots of issues with stability, noise, numerics, etc. So, um, so in digital, we mostly don't use IIR filters, even though they can be really, really nice. We mostly use FIR filters. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So let's build a really dumb FIR low-pass filter just to see how it's done. This is not a great filter, but it's a filter. It will do a thing. So first some notation. Uh, just like we've always talked about, X sub i is the ith sample input. Y sub i is the ith sample of output. That should say i. The amplitude of the sample is, you know, assumed to be between minus one and one. We're not going to mess around with amplitudes. And so here the filter equation is going to be take the ith input, the previous input, the one before that, the i minus one input, add them up and divide by two. So this is a convolution, right? It's a convolution that has coefficient one half for x sub i and one half for x sub i minus one. And that output, y, y sub i, is going to be the output of our filter. So the delay of this filter is sort of one sample, right? Because you need to know the, you have to, the previous sample is used in computing the output of the current sample. And so you really can't output the current sample until you've seen not only the current input, but the input before that. So this is going to lag by one. Eh. Um, why is it a low-pass filter? Well, imagine you know that we've got a, a, a low frequency. Well, then x sub i and x sub i minus 1, those two samples are close together. And at low frequencies, they aren't going to vary very much. And so they're going to be pretty close together. And the average, whatever it is, will be pretty close to the original value. We really won't lose much of our low frequency signal. At a higher frequency, things are changing faster. And so if we take the average, right, it's going to be closer to zero than the higher of those two. It's going to be smushed down. And so, um, you know, in particular, if one is positive, the other is negative, then averaging them will get a number close to zero. And so what we're going to see is the higher frequencies will tend to cancel out. The lower frequencies will tend to reinforce. And so we will tend to have this be a filter. It's not a good filter, mind you. It's a filter. Uh, it doesn't have much of a knee at all. It sort of very gradually drops in response as you go out in frequency space. Um, but one sample latency is not bad, and it's sure cheap to implement this filter. And so it's, if you'd only need a terrible filter, this is a great way to get it. Um, one game you can play as well is to take one of those and put the output into another one of those. And then there's this weird multiplying effect. What you normally do if you want a better filter, a filter with a sharper knee that is closer to the brick wall frequency response we talked about last time, is you use a lot more of the history. You do a big convolution instead of a little convolution. It's really common to do thousands of samples of history in your convolutions. and in class tomorrow, I'll show you some software that does that, and we'll talk a little bit about it. The um, You can get very, very sharp filters if you're willing to spend a lot per sample to get things out of the filter, right? So this general convolution here is going to take um, sort of 
k multiplications to compute the individual terms and then k additions k minus one additions to get the thing out um the qualities for you know the quality per unit cost is not spectacular but boy you can do a lot of multiplications and additions fast on a modern computer so the next lecture we'll talk about well what coefficient should i use should i really just average to get a low pass filter probably not in most situations there's better plans for how to get the filter i actually want i keep talking about low pass filters why would i care so much about low pass filters well two reasons one is that the low pass filters are the most commonly used filters in audio. They're used for anti-aliasing, they're used for suppression of high frequency noise, they're used for all kinds of things. And so there's that. But also, because it turns out that if we're doing FIR filters, if we have these convolution FIR filters, and we have a low pass filter that we like, we can get the other kinds sort of for free from that design. So it turns out that one thing we could do is we could take all the coefficients and negate them. So if the coefficient was five before, it's minus five now. And then we could add one to the center coefficient. And weirdly, because reasons, this flips the spectrum around. And so this is the same, if we had a low pass filter before, now we've got a high pass filter. It's the same shape, just flipped the, the it's it's if we had a brick wall low pass filter now we got a brick wall high pass filter with the same cutoff point we can reverse the order of the coefficients this turns out to reverse the spectrum and therefore a high pass filter so if i take my coefficients and turn them around so that the one that was closest to the present is now farthest in the past oh guess what that turns my low pass filter into a high pass filter okay and then there's superposition, which we already kind of knew worked. If we take two equal length filters and average their coefficients, that gives you a spectrum that's the product of the filters. So um, one of the, th the theorems we've mentioned before, but is worth saying again, is that convolution in the time domain is the same as multiplication in the frequency domain and vice versa. And so one of the key ideas we'll see next time about filter design is the idea that the coefficients sort of represent the frequencies that you want to get if you co convolve them into the frequency domain, if you take them to the frequency domain. And so if you do that twice, then you get a product spectrum. So if I take a high pass filter and a low pass filter, then the spectrum I get out is going to have, with different knees, I can get a band pass filter, sorry, a band notch filter. Where I can take a low pass filter up to three kilohertz and a high pass filter above five kilohertz, which I previously got by inversion or reversal. And if I average the coefficients of those two filters, now I get a band notch feature that just filter that just eliminates the stuff between three and five kilohertz. And then if I wanted instead a band pass filter for three to five kilohertz, well, I can invert or reverse again and that'll give me a band pass filter. So there's that, which is nice. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, multiplication in the frequency domain is convolution in the time domain. That means you can use the DFT as a convolution operator. It turns out that if I want to convolve signal like this, I can do it by actually using the DFT as a convolution operator, which is really super interesting. Uh, we won't be worrying about the details of that because this is not a full digital signal processing course, but I will give you the hint that things like SciPy, um, when you ask them to convolve with the convolve operator, they may do a DFT internally if they decide that's the most efficient. So that's some things about FIR filters. Next time I'll talk both about IIR filters briefly, inf infinite impulse response filters, and also talk quite a bit about digital filter design and how you get filters from filters. So like I say, I hope everybody's doing well out there. Thanks so much for listening and I will talk to you again soon.